All right, welcome everyone to How to Deliver Great Presentations. My name is David Needham. I'm very happy to be here. And I'm sharing a link in the chat again for the slides and more resources if you wanna check those out or follow along. If you uh, follow along better by having your own slides, that's a great way to do that. Also, you can always tweet at me, I'm at David Needham, and I'll have that information at the end of the presentation as well. Now, let me get started just by explaining that being a great presenter is half about sort of the soft skills, getting yourself ready, yourself being ready to present, and half getting your presentation ready, your presentation skills, building your deck. So we're gonna be splitting this talk into those two sections. We're gonna start with how to get yourself ready to present, and then end with how to actually build out your deck or prepare your presentation. Now, you might be asking, who is this for? Well pretty much everybody will have to do public speaking at some point in time. Um, but I'm primarily my experience is conference presentations. Uh, so a lot of my examples might relate best to giving a talk at a conference. However, you could also, you know, work in higher ed, like many of you probably do, uh, or uh, in a corporate sort of environment where you're presenting uh, in a meeting that's also totally valid. Uh, and I do also want to be explicit and say that I am speaking from the a perspective of a white cis male. And so I'm speaking of a position of privilege. I take certain things for granted when it comes to public speaking and how what I say is interpreted that may not apply to you. So I'm going to try to make this talk empowering and informative for everyone, uh, but please do ask questions. So you can always put that information in the chat as Abigail so kindly shared. You can always put a question in the chat. I'll do my best to get to those at the end. And if we have any time at the end, I'll, you know, we'll let people unmute and we can talk directly that way. All right, so let's kick things off with our first story about an embarrassing time that we can probably all relate to, and that is puberty. Now, during that transformational time, when all the boys' voices were changing, they were getting deeper, and all those other things were happening, mine didn't change. Uh, it took many, many years. I was in college before my voice became more normal. And, and you know, during that time, I really didn't notice. Uh, it wasn't until I got outside of my circle of friends, I, I was with other groups of people, and I would frequently get teased for having a weird voice. It, it wasn't even like it didn't change. It was just a little unusual to begin with. And so, you know, most people have some form of stage fright. They're scared of public speaking. But I felt like, man, I, I was hyper aware of everything that was going on in the room. If I heard someone giggling or laughing while I was presenting, I assumed that it was about me. They were making fun of my voice or I said something in a funny way. Um, and it led to eventually like lots of imposter syndrome, feeling like I was a fraud, that I don't belong here. I, I don't have a place to speak and present on this topic. And probably everyone in the room already knows more about this topic than I do. I, I probably am just gonna say something stupid. But I realized as I got over the, the voice problem, as I, uh, well, I got, as I got over the voice problem and I still had imposter syndrome, I still had those feelings and I talked to other people that this is just the way things are for most people. It doesn't take having a funny voice to have these feelings. It's just a natural part of public speaking for the average person. So I just wanna state clearly that I believe that you, Everyone here in this room today listening to this has something important to share. And I'm here today to try to help you dispel those feelings of doubt and to really boost your confidence and help you feel prepared to speak publicly, to present. So let's begin with some tips. First of all, practice. I mean, it might be pretty self-explanatory, but practicing is actually fairly difficult. Now, the best way to practice a presentation is to present it alone without stopping. Start at the beginning, enter presenter mode, go all the way to the end. That's the tricky part, getting all the way to the end before stopping. And then check how long it took you. Is it too short, too long? Um, take any notes about maybe the things you'd like to improve or say differently, make corrections, and then do it again. Go through it as many times as you can but until you actually feel like you are prepared to talk about that topic. And I have to admit, I did not fully practice this presentation. I, I've given this one several times before, but I've made some significant changes this time, and I just did not have time set aside to go through this from start to finish. So even though practice is self-explanatory, it's still really, really difficult to actually do. 
Once you've went through it yourself though, it's a great idea to get feedback. Bring in a friend or a colleague, uh, in this case, maybe on Zoom, give your presentation to someone else. Um, again, tell them you're gonna go all the way through it from start to finish. Don't let them stop and interrupt you if you can. Uh, and then take their feedback into consideration, but make the decision yourself. If they give you feedback that you don't agree with, you do not have to implement it. It's important that the presentation be in your voice, telling your story, giving your examples. So if you feel strongly about something, it's totally okay to say, I'm gonna do it this way because I think that's important. Also be confident, acknowledge that imposter syndrome is real and confidence is important even if you don't fully believe that it's there. You can hold in your hands both imposter syndrome where I feel like I don't belong here, this isn't something I should be doing, as well as holding, I've put a lot of work into this presentation, I've prepared for this. Uh, I was asked to give this presentation and selected among all the other people, so I belong here. And I still hold these two in contention all the time. Uh, even today, I still feel this way. Even though I've talked, you know, now giving different presentations a lot, but it's okay. The important, is to, the important point is to really be confident. People will see it when you're presenting if you are confident, even if internally you still kind of have those feelings of doubt, those may never go away. And that's okay. Just remember that at this point, you've researched the topic. You've rehearsed it going from start to finish one or two or however many times. You've gotten feedback. You've made revisions. At this point, you have probably put more time into this topic than anyone else who's in your audience, even if you didn't feel that way when you were first selected to give that talk. So you really do know more about this topic. You are prepared because you have helped yourself be prepared for that. And if none of that works, it's okay. Find a trusted friend, find someone that can be your cheerleader who can help encourage you, that can boost your confidence because we all need someone like that who can tell us that we're doing a great job and we should keep doing those things. So be on the lookout for that person if you don't already have them in mind and get them to help you through this. Now in the fourth grade, I started playing the trombone. I went through a pep band, we did marching band, we did concert band and you know, all the way up into college. And I distinctly remember this time where we had practiced months and months to prepare for this big concert. So the day of the concert comes, I, I'm up on stage and you know we're, we're sort of sitting in an arrangement kind of like you see on the screen here. And pretty soon, relatively quickly into the, into the concert, I make a huge mistake. It's painfully obvious to me and I am just embarrassed and discouraged for the entire rest of the concert. But afterwards, I went and spoke to my parents, I went and spoke to other people, literally nobody noticed that I made that huge mistake that was painfully obvious to me. And as I got more into public speaking, I realized the same lesson can be applied here as well. The only way that someone will realize that you made a mistake or left out some important point is if you draw attention to it. If you stop and say like, oh, I'm sorry, or oops, I made a mistake, let me go back. Or if you apologize and kind of put yourself in that position, that is way worse than just knowing that you made a mistake and moving on, kind of you know, pushing through it and just continuing. Uh, that is a much better way to kind of make it less obvious. So try to apply those skills as you're uh, presenting as well and keep your confidence level high. The next thing is to be pumped. You've probably all went to some kind of presentation, somebody who is very enthusiastic and excited and passionate about the topic that they're presenting on. Even if it's a topic you are not particularly interested in, their excitement is contagious. You start to get excited about the topic too, just because they're excited. So it's important to try to harness that for yourself. Try to get yourself in a mode of excitement as you're preparing to present. Uh, a lot of people, myself included, have a, a sort of a ritual. We'll, we'll do certain things to prepare ourselves mentally to begin to present. Um, some things I did today, uh, I'm not wearing sweatpants or joggers. I'm wearing actual like dress pants, even though you can't see them. It's part of what I do to help prepare myself, to feel good about myself when I'm presenting. It's, I, of course, I did it when I was presenting live. Um, I also have my uh, Starbucks peppermint um, mocha, which is just part of what I would typically do when I'm presenting. And it's I, I went out to get one today. Um, some people 
will do like a little bit of exercise, like a little, you know, some push-ups to kind of get themselves pumped up or put on special shoes or something. It's kind of up to you. you only you really know what that thing is. Um, some people listen to a particular song to get themselves pumped up and ready to go. Um, and there's also some sort of bodily movements and tricks you can do. Like uh, you can put your arms up over your head. You can kind of like victory sort of fiero sort of feeling um, that can mentally get those pieces moving. Even if you don't feel that way at first, you can sort of trick yourself into getting excited and ready. So um, get through that, you know, get yourself ready and excited and really affirm all of the hard work that you've done to get there. You are now at the point where you get to present and share those things with the rest of the people. Um, it might, some people often uh, will also sort of have some phrases they speak to themselves to prepare. You could say like, you know, this may be difficult, but I can handle it. Little like words of affirmation can help yourself prepare. And again, it may not seem like much, it might seem a little hokey, but things like that really do help. So it might help other people more than you, might help, you know, whatever, but uh, consider it, try it out. Also, of course, the thing you can do to get better at presenting is to just give more presentations. Put yourself in opportunities to present. Um, locally here in Champaign, we have a few different Toastmaster groups that you can join if you wanna get sort of like formal training on presenting and public speaking. Right now, of course, things are a little bit uh, different with online things. There are online Toastmasters you can join, but you know that's a little different too. Um, some things you could do um, that might be a little bit more fun, though, if, if you have a group of friends or colleagues that want to all sort of level up together and to get better at presenting, you could do something like play a game of slideshow karaoke. Uh, that's a technique or a, sort of a game where you, you get a group of slides, usually I think 10 or 15 slides that you've never seen before. You stand up in front of your friends, you pull up the slides, and then you present with these totally random and sometimes really funny slides trying to make a presentation improvisational. Um, so that's a way just to kind of relax, to try to present in a way that's a little bit fun uh, and engaging and can help boost your confidence for that as well. Also, you know, it couldn't hurt to join an improv group. Uh, locally, uh, there's, there's several different options, but uh, I, uh, I would occasionally go to some classes with Zoo Improv, it's a local place. Um, I think they're planning on starting back up eventually later this year or maybe next year, but they have classes throughout the year. Joining an improv group can be a great way to just feel comfortable being in front of people and being a little funny. You know, you're, you're used to people laughing at you, uh, when you when you're doing improv. And so that can be a really good way to kind of get out of your shell too. Um, also, if you're looking for opportunities locally to present, um, you could join, there's a, a great group on campus called the, the Weekly Camp, uh, Caffeine Break. Um, they typically give uh, sort of casual tech-focused presentations every Friday. Um, they have discussion groups and things like that. Again, they're also meeting online right now. Um, if you're local and you want to attend one of those, you can uh, go through the CCSP to sign up for that. Um, they do also have a mailing list, and I'll, I'll put the little knowledge base article on there if you want to get signed up for the mailing list to get notified when those things happen it is entirely possible that you have a if you have a topic in mind they would welcome uh, submissions and ideas and opportunities to have more people talking um, speaking of that though I would encourage you to check out beginner topics if, if you're not sure what you can talk about consider thinking about the things that you have went through in the last six months or so something that was totally new to you then, Talk about what you've learned. Talk about the struggles that you've had as you've went through that particular topic and what you've sort of accomplished at the end. Uh, my first conference presentation was about Drupal, only about two or three months after I'd first installed it. Uh, and that was because I was at a university, at Bradley University in Peoria. And my instructor encouraged me at the end of the sem semester to submit to the uh, Drupal Camp Wisconsin. Um, and I did. Even though I didn't feel confident, even though I had just installed Drupal, I had definitely, definitely lots of imposter syndrome there. But I was able to share my experience getting into Drupal for the first time. I was able to share the things that I learned and what I built with it during that you know, sort of beginning time. And the feedback was very positive. People found it to be very encouraging. People in the audience who are also getting started with Drupal 
uh, were going through the same things that I had already solved. So they were there and, and had a good time too. So become a master at beginner topics. Beginner topics are a wonderful way to get started. You don't have to jump into the deep end of something super technical, unless that's your place to be. That's okay too. All right, and the last tip of the day is telling stories. Telling stories is actually very important. Uh, when you tell a story, you get inside of people's heads. Uh, we are conditioned from birth to listen and put ourselves into a story that we're being told. Uh, when we're in the story, we start looking for meaning, we start anticipating what's gonna happen. This turns your audience into an active participant. It makes that knowledge that you're sharing with them become like in their brain, they're following along very passionately, very like intimately with you. And that means that that information will stick around a lot longer as well. Um, but, so it's good for the audience. It's good for what they can take away from your talk. But sharing stories is also easier for you as the presenter. It makes your job as a professional public speaker seem much more natural because nobody wants you to read a slide. Nobody wants to see a wall of text on the screen. They don't want you to read it. They don't, you know, the slides are not there for you. They're there for the audience. The, the slides should, you know, inform or you know, get them inspired or excited or, or something. But if you have a story, you don't have to memorize the slide. You don't have to refer to your speaker notes every two seconds to make sure you didn't miss anything. You're just telling a story and you remember it because it's much easier to remember a story than the fine points of your slide. So if you memorize your stories, you go through, you share your stories with your audience, it's better for them. It's also better for you, it's easier. Uh, it's also important to remember that case studies are in just another form of corporate storytelling. You can turn a great case study into a really great story as well. So if you're coming from the business perspective or the higher education, that you can grab case studies and turn them into your own stories, make them a little bit better. So one example that we can jump into is you know, I work for a company named Pantheon. We do uh, web ops, we're website operations or website hosting for Drupal and WordPress. And we have this new feature called Pantheon Autopilot. Now I could spend hours talking about the benefits of Pantheon and why this feature actually matters. But instead, let me start with a question. When was the last time that you updated your website software? If you have a Drupal or WordPress website, there's probably something available right now, probably for the average person, very few people actually keep on top of that. And when I worked at an agency, when I was building these websites for customers all the time, I spent hours and hours each week making sure that all of the websites were up to date, making sure that everything was ready and safe to go and you know doing testing to make sure that we weren't going to break something by applying an update and that took a lot of time away from doing the work that we were actually there to do um, i didn't enjoy that work at all i wanted to focus on the cool you know exciting work instead i had to spend a lot of time on maintenance well pantheon autopilot is a feature that will completely automate the maintenance step spins up a development environment, it applies the updates, it does visual regression testing, and if everything passes, it can deploy those up to your live site. So this is a Pantheon pitch. I'm not going to go any more into it than that, but you can see that by telling a story, it can help you relate to the thing that we're actually talking about. It'll kind of help you understand where we're coming at and hopefully, hopefully convince you that it's not a bad idea yourself. All right. Uh, another idea, another story would be something like a Drupal configuration management. You know, some stories that you might want to tell are fictional. Maybe you want to do it as a, a fictional story to illustrate a point. Uh, you can even put the audience in the, per the, the first person directly. So you could say, hey, you know what sucks? Losing content. And you just lost that blog post that your customer wrote because you were trying to move configuration into the live environment and you overwrote the database. That's risky and it's not a good way to do web ops. And I could go in and talk about Drupal 9 configuration management and how it moves it to code. And you know, I'm sort of paraphrasing a little bit here in the interest of time, but you can see these stories kind of put you in that perspective. Even if you don't necessarily intend to follow along and kind of put yourself there, it's just a natural thing that happens. All right, so now let's transition over into standardizing slides and presentation techniques. I, 
When I uh, took this job at Pantheon, I got this book, Slideology by Nancy Duarte. Uh, this book helped me to better understand slide technique uh, and really refine the way that I present. Uh, it's important to remember that your audience is there to listen to you, not read what you wrote. But if you have text on the screen, they will read it. People can't do two things at once. So if you have text on the screen, all that they're doing is reading your slides. They are not listening to you. So it's very important to kind of remember that, to try to shy away from lots of text on screen whenever you can. Uh, and also remember that slides are not there for you. They're not there as your visual aids for uh, remembering what to say necessarily. Um, so the only time that you should really read your slide is if you have a quote. If it's something you absolutely want to hammer home, you have one small piece visible and talk through that with the audience. So the first consideration as you are preparing to create your presentation is who is my audience? Well, think about who you're going to be presenting to, whether it is the executives of your department, uh, maybe it's some people on your team, some colleagues that you share experience with, or maybe it's you know the 47 people we have in this room right now at a conference or something like that. Well, think about that. When, when I give this talk in person, I try to take a picture and show the people, hey, you're my audience right now. Obviously, it's a little bit trickier since we're doing this online. Um, but some things you can do if you have an opportunity, always walk around the room before your talk and get to know the people that are there. Not only does it help you feel more comfortable at hearing your voice in the room and all of that stuff, it helps other people feel comfortable asking questions and engaging with you. It also helps you to get to know the people that are there so that you can anticipate their questions. You can sometimes customize or personalize your talk on the fly to make it more relevant to them. And that is huge for making your presentation better. Now, as I said, doing it online is a lot tougher, but there are some tricks you can do to think about this. One way is to create uh, one or more personas. Now, a persona can just be uh, some information about a person that you anticipate attending your workshop. It's sort of trying to identify and give a personality to your audience. So you can create you know, a full name for a person, a headshot, maybe some information about them and their life, you know, things that are important to them. And then why would they attend your workshop? Why would they be there to listen to you talk? So here's one that I created for my colleague, Tara. And I'm going to warn you, it's a lot of text. You're probably going to be reading the text, and that's OK. I'm sort of anticipating that to some degree. But this is an idea of what a persona could look like. By having, in this case, a real person, it's even more personal, like I can know them. But it's also OK to create a fake personality. But you want that headshot so you can see them. You want a real name so you can kind of put a name to it. And then thinking about why they would attend this talk. So Tara here wants to develop her storytelling skills because she thinks it could help her team get excited to work on a difficult project. So that is what I'm going to be thinking about as I'm going through and creating my presentation. Once you have one or more, you know, sometimes three might be a, a good enough place to start uh, personas in mind, you can start to ask yourself questions like, would this point that I'm trying to make resonate with Tara? You know, would Tara be moved by this story that I'm planning to include? And would it help her with her goals for attending my workshop? If you have a persona in mind, it makes it so much easier to personalize your, your workshop and make it all the more relatable to your audience. Consideration number two is what is my main point? Most people don't get up and present because it's fun. You probably have a reason that you're trying to get across when you're presenting. And it's a good idea to think about your personas and kind of work backwards from that. What are you trying to get them to do or feel or understand? Every slide that you have in your deck should clearly support the main point of the presentation or you should take it out. And it's important that you're not, oops, it's important that you are not ambiguous or that you don't exit your uh, presentation in the middle of it by pressing the escape key. Oh, I got to exit full screen. This is one of those cases where I wouldn't apologize for making a mistake, except that it's kind of unavoidable. You kind of see what's happening. So there's no way for me to get around that. It is A-OK. -okay. All right, we're back in business. OK, 
So let me take a look at a data slide. And again, because there is stuff on the screen like this right now, you are already not listening to me. It's OK. I expect that. When you have data slides like this with information, people that are watching are naturally inclined to try to get the point. They're trying to understand why you would show this. They're trying to understand how the data relates to each other. They're trying to really understand what you're showing them. And if you don't have a clear point defined, then they have to draw their own conclusions, which could either result in them not understanding what you're wanting them to understand, or they draw the wrong conclusion, which can be far worse than what you're trying to accomplish. So what was the point of this data? Why would I show this particular slide? Well, um, you know, there could be several reasons. Um, you know, these sort of gray areas here are the weekends. And so maybe my point is to show that, you know, our, our viewership drops off on the weekends. Maybe I can look here and say, oh, look, the, you know, of the people who are on the getting started page, only 20% of them or 26% of them actually click the play button. That seems pretty low. Or maybe it's that, you know, of those same people, well, they only make it about, you know, 74% of the way through the video. They don't even finish the video for some reason. What, what can we do? See, so by being a little vague, by just showing a bunch of information, you have to figure out what I'm talking about. There's a great quote from the book uh, from Nancy Duarte that says, data slides are not really about the data. They're about the meaning of the data. Why did you include this slide? What is the main point? How does this data support the point that you're trying to get across to your audience? Well, in my case, this is from a, a real presentation that I gave. The reason why I included this slide was because we were working on a new template for our videos, a new, a new way of doing our videos. And guess what? The new format actually works. Uh, even though this is our newest video, it's already our second most played. And people are about twice as likely to click that play button on that particular video. So this is what I'm highlighting. This, this template, this new format works, and we should keep doing these videos in these formats. So that's important to think about. Be clear. Also be thinking about that a lot of times people are going to see your slides after the presentation. And if you don't have it clearly defined what your point is on the screen visually, again, they're left to draw their own conclusions because they don't have the benefit of you explaining it to them. So try to be as explicit and clear as you can with your point, especially if you're including a slide with a lot of data. Consideration number three is, can this be simplified? Once you have your deck, once you have some of that information there, what can you do to simplify things? Well, there are kind of two ways to think about this in, in some ways. Um, you know, if sort of A is your baseline, you can make things better in your presentation, you know, slightly move it to the right by doing more great work or, you know, by just including more slides that reinforce your point. Or a little bit easier often is to do less bad work, which in our case with presentations could mean take out the slides that don't support your point as well as other ones. Take out the slides that are a little bit distracting or maybe just aren't, aren't as good. Um, and that can also just improve your presentation. It's, it's even more true with presentations because our attention span is very limited, uh, especially with online presentations like this. We want to get to the point as quickly as possible. So rather than adding more slides, think about what slides you can remove. Uh, I actually practiced this presentation. I didn't go through the whole thing. Uh, I, I practiced it earlier with my wife, and I realized that I have too much content. So I had to go through and think about which one of my slides and my stories were maybe not as strong as the others, and I started removing them. And it was very difficult to do, but I hope it results in a better presentation at the end of the day. Now, simplification can also refer to how you are designing your slides. Uh, if we take a look, I know it's very small, but you know this is an example of what our slide templates looked like at Pantheon back when I first started. Every deck that we had would be made up of slides just full of text. And over time, as I started embracing the Slideology book and practicing different things, I realized that that could be drastically improved just by reducing the amount of text, maybe adding a little image, something like that, removing some of the visual elements to simplify what was on the screen. But I think it can be made even better by having one key point. Because if you have even a paragraph of text on the screen, people are going to try to read that text. 
even if you're trying to talk to them. So if you can get it down to one concise point and a nice big graphic that reinforces your illustration, then that can be even better. And these graphics can be great visual cues to tell you when it's time to tell a story and remind yourself what the story is that you're about to tell. Um, and then you could take it one step further, get rid of the, the text altogether. Although, you know, as I was preparing this presentation, I realized that in the days of Zoom, the ways that we're doing things right now, um, this may not be true anymore because as much as I would like to think that you are all paying 100% attention to me, that you're all watching and engaged directly, I know what this is like. Um, some of you have chats or Slack or whatever it might be open. Um, some of you are probably in the same room with a child uh, or other family members and there's distractions. It's normal. It happens. That's okay. But as a result of there being distractions and you, you can't give it a like your full attention, it means that if you look away for a second and you look back and I just have a picture of you know Settlers of Catan on the screen, that doesn't help you very much. You, you can't follow along as well. So I am still struggling with this. I'm still trying to figure out what level of detail to include on the slide that will help you understand and kind of follow along uh, and still be helpful for the presentation. And then of course, thinking about people viewing your slides afterwards. Uh, this might be a case for using speaker notes where you can explain your thoughts or your story in the speaker notes for people later. Um, it's ideas, it's something we can be, be talking about later. Now, another thing to consider is how your actual presentation is going to be viewed. Um, are they going to be watching it on their monitor or a television? Are they going to be you know, live watching it through a projection screen or something like that? It's important to be thinking about how the majority of your audience will be consuming your content because it's very important that you think about these accessibility concerns. Um, how readable is your slide? What background and foreground colors are you using? What text uh, font size are you using? Is, is it very readable? Uh, one little trick to test visibility for your text is if you have a, let's say a 21 inch monitor, you know, sort of corner to corner, um, you put your screen, your, your slide up, take a step back, kind of measure 21 inches away from the screen. And if you can clearly read the text, then it's, you know, for the majority of, of your audience, it's probably pretty clear. Again, there's lots of considerations that can go into that and you probably want to err on the side of caution, but that is a sort of baseline that is recommended in the book of like testing to make sure that it's at least you know readable for most people. Um, of course, providing your slides to the audience in advance and during can be an even better way. Uh, one of my colleagues, Dan, um, has mentioned that it's sometimes very difficult for him to see the screen, uh, even if he's sitting in the front row. And so anytime he can get the slides in advance, it helps him to follow along much more closely. Uh, so anytime that you can include the slides is also a, a great benefit. Uh, and another thing to consider is a visually simple design. If you're trying to simplify, if you're trying to make your point very clear, try to keep your slides very clear and to the point. Don't have a lot of extra noisy stuff going on if you can help it. But yeah, all of these things are accessibility concerns. And with this in mind, I'm gonna bring up potentially a controversial topic. And that is, in the interest of simplicity, should we be including bio slides? I've been to a lot of conference presentations. I frequently include a bio slide that introduces myself, but I would advocate for not introducing yourself or at least not spending a lot of time in the introduction phase, because frankly, a lot of people don't really care about who you are or what your credentials are. It's just not that important. And it does ultimately detract from engagement. You know, you have a limited amount of time at the beginning to catch people's attention. And if you waste time talking about yourself and you know why you're there, you can often end with people just tuning you out really early. Now, the, the flip side, the alternative is like, instead of including a bio slide and kind of talking about your credentials and all that stuff, you could tell a story about yourself. Um, I have a blog post that I just published last night. I'm gonna put the link to it in the... Um, yes, Daniel, I see that you're, you're reading my biography now because I have text on the screen. Uh, I, I put a link in the chat. This takes you to a blog post uh, that I wrote that includes some writing prompts for coming up with your introductory story or your origin story or whatever you want to call it. Um, 
if you feel like you need to introduce yourself, then at least tell a story that ties your audience into your experience, that shows them uh, why it's important, why it's relevant. So I'm not going to spend any more time on that. Let's just kind of move on and, and think about uh, if you want to learn more about it, you can click the link and go through there. Although if you do have questions, you can always put that in the chat. All right, the next consideration is, can this be more engaging? How do I engage my audience and get them really into what I'm talking about? How can you make them the topics click and be more clear? How can we make this talk more fun and engaging? Well, there's lots of ways. Let's go through a few of them. First of all, you can do a poll. And in person, I would often start a presentation uh, or like at some point go through, I would say, hey, raise your hand if you are using Drupal 7, OK, Drupal 8, OK, Drupal 9, and, and, and go through and get an idea. And this helps immediately because it you're asking something of the audience. They have to respond. So you're engaging them. You're getting their attention. Uh, it helps for that reason. It helps them pay attention. It also helps you to understand who your audience is. So again, you can contextualize on the fly, help to make your talk more relevant to who's there. But then also, I was told this in feedback later that um, sometimes as an audience member, you love to get this sort of hand pull visualization because it helps people realize that there are other people in the room that are just like them. That this topic is relevant to them, that there's other people that are struggling with this topic or whatever it might be, and it's okay, you're in the right place. So that's a great way to do that. Now, again, in Zoom, it's a little bit tricky. There is a polling feature. Um, I personally find it to be pretty clunky, um, unfortunately. Now, I have seen some other people here at uh, WebCon use AHA Slides, A-A-H-A-S-L-I-D-E-S.com. Um, it's a paid thing. I think they have a free tier as well. Thank you, Jay Ray, for, for sharing. I first saw it actually in, in your, your training on Wednesday. Um, yeah, AHA slides can be a really great way to engage your audience through not just polling, but also, you know, like open answers or uh, open prompts. Um, they also did a little bit of a game show at the end to test your knowledge and make sure that you were kind of following along. So there's lots of options for tools like this. There's, there's many alternatives to do some sort of an interactive poll. Another thing that you can do is ask for suggestions. At this point in the talk, if we were live and you were able to unmute, I would invite you to say like, hey, who here has given a presentation? And you know, what helped you get through it? What helped you prepare? What, what point haven't I shared that you have found especially helpful? And the answers that I've gotten from those prompts in the past have been so wonderful. I've, I've incorporated some of them back in my presentation because they're so good. Um, not only does it take some of the weight off of your shoulders as the presenter, it lets other people have a space to talk, which can be a little bit dangerous sometimes, but that's an aside. Um, but it helps other people get engaged and feel more comfortable also sharing what they're going through. Another thing you can do is ask for a story. And this is very similar. You can ask the audience and say, hey, has this ever happened to you? Can you share a time that you just really rocked a presentation? How did that feel? Uh, sometimes if you're planning to ask for a story, it couldn't hurt to in some ways like seed the story, or at least as you're going through the audience, maybe you know, as you're talking to someone, be like, hey, that's a really cool story. Do you mind sharing that for the group later? And then when the time comes in your presentation, you can call on them and ask them if they're willing to share it and you know, kind of go through that. That can help keep you from having an awkward situation where you ask for a story and you wait. And you're like, okay, well, I guess there's no story. Let's keep moving, kind of awkward. Um, so having that prepared in advance can, can help. And then finally, um, you can ask a, a really pointed question, kind of like storytelling. If you ask a question, you, the audience subconsciously has to answer the question. So if I ask you, how would being a better public speaker make you better at your job? All I have to do is ask the question. You don't have to verbally say it out loud. You don't have to think about an answer. Subconsciously, you have already worked through it in some way. It's really interesting and kind of strange exactly how it happens. But including prompts like this throughout your presentation can help keep people engaged 
by helping them cycle through and think about and realize how important your presentation is to what they're trying to accomplish. All right, so now as a bit of a wrap up, I, I want to leave plenty of time here for questions. Uh, so let's um, take a look in the mirror for a minute. Let's think about our presentations and think about what we can fix. Um, I like to, sometimes it's difficult to listen to your own voice, but if you can go back and watch your presentation later and think about what you can improve. What parts worked really well, what parts didn't work really well? What part was really awkward and should maybe be refined a little bit more? Do that later, you know, sometime later once you get the recording. Um, also, take a moment immediately after your presentation and just write, write down notes, you know, add speaker notes or something, comments to your slides so that you can immediately apply that feedback to the next time that you present. Sometimes it might be relevant to the presentation, other times it could be more generic presentation skill things like, am I using trigger words? Am I using um, uh, like, things like that, that can be really distracting to your audience. Also, I, I know that historically I've had some problems with movement. I, I'm at a standing desk right now, but even when I was at the podium, I would frequently sort of wave back and forth throughout my presentation. That's something I have tried to be grounded. I've tried to like, be more stable for the camera especially, or if I'm moving behind a podium, I try to be more deliberate about my movement, not just sort of waving back and forth. So that's something that I identified about myself after looking at my presentations uh, and realized I could fix. And for this particular presentation, I think I need to take a closer look at online presentations and specifically presentation skills for this new age that we're in. I, I don't think I think you know, we're going to go back to an age where we're presenting in person again. That's obvious. But there's many conferences I've been talking to and that I would typically present at where they're not just doing in person anymore. They're going to be doing hybrid for some period of time where they do in person, some people, but then also live streaming. So we need to continue to improve and get better at presenting online through a computer, through a camera without actually being able to see our audience and those visual cues that we're used to. So I need to be thinking about this myself and what I can do to improve my slides and techniques to make it even more engaging for you know, someone who maybe can't give, up, give this their full intention in the moment. Now, if you're looking for uh, ways to present, another thing you can consider, of course, is WebCon. You know, I love attending WebCon, not just because I'm local, but because there's a great group of people here, a very friendly community. And I would encourage you, if you have an idea for a topic, please consider submitting it to WebCon next year. Think about being a killer at beginner topics, uh, being a sort of a master beginner it might be a good way, a weird, weird way of putting it perhaps. But think about those beginner topics that you're just getting started with that you wish you had known six months ago when you were just getting started. What presentation do you wish you had seen back then? Because more than likely someone else in the audience is going through that right now. So consider that and, and you know, pitch as many talks as you can within reason. I think uh, when you're submitting at a, a conference like this, I, I usually try to go for no more than three submissions, depending on the conference. Sometimes they have rules about that, but it helps to really give the organizers a variety to pick from. It lets you sort of have uh, different ideas. It lets them pick different options depending on what they're going for with their conference. So that's that's a great way to do it. But yes, please consider submitting to WebCon. All right, I see where we are. We have about fifteen minutes left. Um, I'm going to move on to my question slide. But before we wrap it up, I did have some other topics that I wanted to talk on just really briefly. So I think this would be, you know, no more than just a few minutes. Um, specifically, I haven't really talked too much about presentation skills for uh, online, like this. Um, there, there's a few things that I maybe take for granted now that I've been, I mean, I've, I've worked remotely for several years, so I, I maybe take some of these for granted. But one of the things is, this can be really tough, when you're presenting, try to look directly at the camera. I, I'm looking at you directly. Uh, if you can look directly into someone's eyes, it's another way of boosting engagement. And so 
rather than looking at my picture, which is you know just a little bit below the camera, that helps in some way, or my speaker notes, which is directly below that on the screen, I'm, I'm trying whenever I'm talking to look directly at that little lens in the middle of the camera. And it is very difficult at first. It does get a little bit easier over time, uh, but consider that. Another thing that I find extremely helpful is to have an external monitor. Uh, right now, I kind of wish I could kind of take a step back and show you easily, but I have a computer that has my presentation on it. And that is what I'm sharing. I'm sharing the screen of my computer while I'm looking at my speaker notes and Zoom and all the chat and all the other stuff on my external monitor that I keep actually behind my, my computer. Um, actually, when we have time at the end, there's a, a video that I made real quick last year for MidCamp, the Midwest Drupal Camp. It's some, a quick video showing how I set up my, uh, my computer for presenting on Zoom. Uh, so I'll, I'll share that, and that might be a better way rather than spending time going through some of these things here now. So with that, I see we have a few minutes left. I'm going to um, keep this on the screen for just a little bit and open the floor. Now, I'm going to um, maybe scroll up in the little chat window and see what sorts of questions you might have received. If you have a, a, a question, feel free to throw it in the chat. If you have ideas, suggestions, topics, you know, things that I didn't cover that you think are important, please do share them because there are probably other people here that could still benefit from that. All right, let me, uh, for your convenience, let me share the link again to the slides so that you have easy access to them. You can also tweet at me, at David Needham. And let me scroll back up and look at the list to see what sorts of questions we have. I see Ben is saying, yes, for Toastmasters. I'm part of one of the local clubs, McKinley Toastmasters. It's all on Zoom right now, but we'll eventually be back at the Champagne Library. Yeah, I, I think I might have attended that one a couple of times. CU has a local, local Pika Kucha group, which is another great option. And the, the link was shared for that. Thank you for that. Uh, I see some people are talking about WordPress updates uh, happening automatically. Um, yes. I still feel re really skittish about allowing uh, updates to happen automatically without some sort of automated test to verify that nothing is breaking in the process. So yes, WordPress technically does have some automated uh, updates in place. Drupal is also, if they don't have it out now, are, are working on rolling out some, some form of automated updates as well. But again, you really need some sort of automated test to make sure it's not working or not, not breaking anything. David, I have a quick question. So I mm -hmm. like that you gave that example of using your uh, your Tara example as sort of the, the person you're speaking to or thinking of. And is that is that kind of what you do on these Zoom calls? I find Zoom to be intimidating in the sense that sometimes there's two people, sometimes there's 102 people. I don't know who I'm looking at. Like right now I'm looking at you, can you tell? <laughs> so I don't know where to keep, I know you said to look directly in the camera and so forth, but I have difficulties sort of addressing people when I'm trying to public publicly speak and be engaging when I'm not sure who I'm looking at and I'm not getting any response. So can you talk to me a little bit about how you deal with that? That is really tough. Um, switching to speaking at conferences online virtually is very difficult because it does feel like you're talking into a black box. We are all used to as humans getting nonverbal cues and you know smiles when you say something funny or a little chuckle here and there. And when that doesn't happen, when it's everyone's muted and sometimes their video is muted too, it can be very difficult. I think it's just something that you kind of get better at with 